Tonight, the ultimate betrayal. The boss of ASIO reveals a retired politician was recruited by international spies. Three schools now caught up in the asbestos contamination scare after receiving mulch with potential fragments. Banks fast-track an end to cheques, leaving some older Australians behind. And the Matildas book their ticket to the Paris Olympics after a resounding 10-0 win against Uzbekistan. Good evening, Jessica Van Vonderen with ABC News. A cloud of suspicion hangs over dozens and possibly hundreds of former politicians across Australia. After the revelation, one has been a spy for a foreign country. The head of Australia's top security agency, ASIO, says the figure sold out their country by joining a secret influence operation. But with no name and no clarity on whether he or she was a federal or state MP, public demands are being made for more information to narrow down the traitor. Here's defence correspondent Andrew Green. Inside a building of secrets... Welcome to ASIO. ...a tantalising glimpse into a clandestine overseas spy ring. Right now, there is a particular team in a particular foreign intelligence service with a particular focus on Australia. The ASIO boss revealing how operatives dubbed the A-Team successfully cultivated a former Member of Parliament several years ago. This politician sold out their country, party, former colleagues to advance the interests of a foreign regime. With attempted infiltration into the highest levels of government. At one point the former politician even proposed bringing a Prime Minister's family member into the spy's orbit. But when challenged to identify the unnamed culprit... I'm not going to name the individual. Um, we're a rule-of-law country. Instead, Mike Burgess noted that tougher foreign interference laws had been passed since this episode. Personally, I don't think they'll be stupid enough to repeat what they've done in the past. The intelligence chief says his decision to publicly call out the A-team is part of a real-world, real-time disruption, letting the foreign spies know that their activities here have been uncovered. But his decision to not identify the former politician is generating a furious guessing game inside this building, as well as demands for more information. The former politician who sold out this country could be in this building right now. Why won't you name the traitor now? It's a matter for the Director General of ASIO if, if he was to choose uh, to name that. I've said I have a fair idea and I'm being careful about what I say publicly because of that. There absolutely would be benefit though in ensuring that not all former politicians uh, carry some sort of smear or smirch upon them. Let's not get offended because we're talking about national security matters. It is clearly in the national interest for this to be the subject of national discussion. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a great pleasure. A very public discussion of work that's usually hidden in the shadows. Andrew Green, ABC News, Canberra. An arrest in Melbourne that triggered an immediate storm of allegations about the Federal Immigration Minister's competence has turned out to be an embarrassing police bungle. After announcing they'd caught a former immigration detainee over a spate of sexual offences, Victoria Police have admitted they got the wrong man and he had nothing to do with the 149 people released from detention by the High Court's ruling last year. Word travels quickly through Parliament House. My question is to the Minister for Immigration. Particularly when it's about the alleged behaviour of an individual recently released into the community. Charged with sexual assault, stalking and two counts of unlawful assault in Victoria. Yesterday, police arrested a man who they said was one of the 149 people set free following last year's High Court ruling that indefinite immigration detention for people who can't be deported was unlawful. He appeared in the Melbourne Magistrates Court today, not once, but twice. The charges dropped this afternoon, with police confirming they'd got the wrong guy. A local man not connected to the released detainees, now the person of interest. With further evidence, it is clear the person arrested is not the offender and for that we are sincerely so sorry that this person has been detained. 
The development coming well after the coalition had sought to make political mileage out of it in question time. Why did the minister fail to use his powers to seek to re-detain this serial sex offender and protect these two Victorian women? I am not in a position and I will not comment on any individual case because I will not Order. risk prejudice any court proceedings. The opposition weaponising the issue ahead of this weekend's by-election in the Melbourne seat of Dunkley. The deputy opposition leader posting on social media, if you live in Frankston and you've got a problem with Victorian women being assaulted by foreign criminals, vote against Labor. Susan Lee's office isn't retreating from that sentiment in light of this embarrassing blunder by Victorian police, arguing there's a broader issue at play with how the government has handled the release of this group. And ahead of the Dunkley poll, it's banking on the community feeling the same. Despite Labor's insistence, it's done all it can to keep them safe. Matthew Doran, ABC News, Canberra. Authorities have narrowed down the list of Queensland businesses potentially exposed to mulch containing asbestos. 16 landscaping companies received the potentially contaminated material from a stockpile of compost from Newgrow in Ipswich, with customers being urged to contact authorities. Three schools have also received some of the mulch, but the areas are construction sites and are not accessible to students, staff or the general public. Experts say the likely airborne spread of the fibres is extremely low though, as the mulch is moist. More exposure sites are expected to be found. But the, the extent of the sites that we've found and the fact that we have stopped distribution uh, through many of those landscape and haulage companies um, gives me some hope that the list won't grow um, uh, significantly. Police say they've broken up an investment fraud ring on the Gold Coast that's allegedly scammed victims out of millions of dollars. The group behind the boiler room operation allegedly defrauded more than $3 million from 300 people between 2018 and 2020. Five people are due to face court in the coming weeks following an extensive investigation. So-called boiler room scams use high-pressure sales tactics and cold calling to trap victims. The state coroner has declared that Gold Coast mother Marion Barter, missing for 27 years, is dead. The Southport school teacher suddenly changed her name to Florabella Natalia Marion Remical before selling her home and leaving her family on a European trip in 1997. She never saw them again. An inquest into her disappearance found she was romantically involved with a man named Rick Bloom. He persuaded Ms Barter, under the alias Fernand Remical, to start a new life with him in Luxembourg. The court found Mr Bloom had a tendency to exploit vulnerable women for financial gain, five of whom provided evidence to the inquest. State Coroner Teresa O'Sullivan also criticised the New South Wales Police investigation, calling it inadequate. The case went uninvestigated for 10 years, despite pleas from Marion's daughter for police to help find her mother. Zip shareholders are up in arms over a recent decision by the company to on-sell their shares. A week before the sale process was announced, two directors picked up a swag of shares on the market and have since reaped the benefits as Zip's recovery gathered pace while smaller shareholders missed out. It was once a rising star in financial services. Now Zip, the buy now pay later hopeful, is facing the ire of shareholders who claim they were forced to sell out when the share price was at a seven year low. It was an initiative that was a few months in the planning. The week before the sale plan was announced, the company's chair, Diane Smith-Gander, and another director, Meredith Scott, put a substantial amount of stock. They complied with the rules, but many small investors feel they were unfairly treated because they have missed out. I think the purchase of shares by the key executives was a, a demonstration that they believed in the future of the company and a, and a strong signal to shareholders. Zip announced the sale plan in October for shareholders who held less than $500 worth of stock. The catch, if shareholders didn't want to sell their shares, they had to opt out by November 20. The ABC has spoken to some shareholders who said the communication wasn't clear. Many only knew their shares had been sold after they disappeared from their brokerage accounts. The company argues these investors were given adequate notice. Investors were, were very well informed. 
But of the 78,000 affected investors, almost 70,000 had their shares sold. They were paid just over 40 cents a share. Since then, the price has more than doubled. Corporate watchdog ASIC says it has had a small number of complaints about alleged misconduct over the notice, but there was no evidence the company broke the listing rules. ASIC says there's room for companies to make it more clear to investors what action needs to be taken to retain their shares, but the Australian Securities Exchange says the rules won't be changed. Nassim Khadem, ABC News. 70-year-old Vileen White, who was fatally stabbed at a shopping centre earlier this month, has been farewelled. The grandmother died during an alleged robbery at an underground car park at Red Bank Plains, west of Brisbane, on February the 3rd. Five teenagers have been arrested in connection with the incident and a 16-year-old boy has been charged with her murder. Family and friends shared memories of her kind and loving nature in an emotional service. Ms White's daughter said she hoped her mother's legacy would push for change in youth crime. We don't want mum to be remembered how she went, but we want her to be remembered of her legacy of her life. The effect she's had on us just as family, as loved ones, and the fact that, you know, Queensland and Australia is being touched. The President of the Philippines has used a landmark speech to Australia's Parliament to declare he will not back down in territorial disputes with China. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has also spruced increasingly close security ties with Australia as the two nations signal they'll expand exercises in the South China Sea. Here's foreign affairs reporter Stephen Jedgetts. A once battle-scarred nation grappling with new forms of conflict and searching for allies. Mr Speaker, the President of the Republic of the Philippines. It's not a war, but the Philippines and China are at loggerheads in the South China Sea. The Philippines now finds itself on the front line against actions that undermine regional peace, erode regional stability and threaten regional success. With Beijing using its navy, coast guard and even militias of fishing boats to try and force the Philippines out of contested waters. For many years the Philippines has been on the front line subjected to grey zone activities. That's angered President Marcos, who's edged closer to the West, using his speech in Canberra today to send a clear message on foreign soil. I will not allow any attempt by any foreign power to take even one square inch of our sovereign territory. Australia's drawing closer to Manila too. Last year, the two nations held their first joint military drills in the South China Sea. Today, signing a new agreement to boost maritime cooperation. Freedom of navigation is fundamental to our sovereignty, our prosperity, our security. We must come together as partners to face the common challenges confronting the region. Not one single country can do this by itself. The president's speech was unusual. Most Southeast Asian leaders want to avoid making a choice between the US and China and would never dream of using language like he did. But Beijing's aggression is hardening resolve in Manila. That creates more of a risk of open conflict, but it also opens new opportunities for countries like Australia. Stephen Jedgetts, ABC News, Canberra. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear Donald Trump's claim he should be immune from prosecution on charges of trying to overturn the 2020 election. The Conservative Majority Court will hear arguments in April, a move which calls into question whether the case could go to trial before the November election. At the same time, an Illinois judge barred the former president from appearing on the state's primary ballot because of his role in the January 6 Capitol riot. But she delayed her ruling due to the Supreme Court hearing. It came as one of the most powerful figures in US politics, Mitch McConnell, announced he was stepping down, potentially ceding more influence to Donald Trump and Republican hardliners. The funeral of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny will take place in Moscow tomorrow, but his widow says she's unsure if it'll be peaceful. 
In a speech to the European Parliament in Strasbourg, Yulia Navalnya expressed fears that police might arrest those who come to say goodbye to her husband. Mr Navalny died earlier this month in a remote Arctic penal colony and many Western leaders have blamed it on the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Navalny described Putin as a monster who could not be negotiated with. While Australians grapple with a cost of living crisis, for many young Japanese, moving down under is a financial boon. Plagued with low wages and economic hardships, Japan is now officially in recession. So Japanese workers are flocking to Australia in record numbers. Armed with a small camera, Shoma Tanaka talks candidly to his social media followers about his earnings, expenses and, most importantly, savings. It is definitely easier to work in Australia. The hours are less than in Japan and the pay is higher in my case, so it's much easier mentally. Since arriving in 2019, he's worked a variety of jobs. Currently, he's at a metalworks factory, earning twice what he would back home. On his YouTube channel, Shoma explains how the higher income, combined with a bit of frugality, has helped him save $200,000 and buy his dad a new car. If there are people who are working and feeling a bit frustrated in Japan, I'd like to let them know that there is a path to choose, a working holiday, and there are possibilities for them. Japan has slipped into recession as the country battles a weak yen and an ageing, shrinking population. I feel the cost of food is going up. And I'm shocked how much the power and gas bills cost lately. I'd like to give more and more back to my employees. However, in reality, while the cost of goods and expenses are rising, it's impossible. The number of Japanese applying to work in Australia has hit record levels as people seek sanctuary from low stagnant wages. There is a very strong incentive for Japanese people to you know, work uh, outside for a certain period and earn money and then come back. It's not all bad news. Major Japanese firms are posting record profits and the stock market is back to all-time highs. What many workers here will want to know is when this good news will flow through to their wallets. I'm worried about my life. From my point of view, Japan is declining. Those economic headwinds may take a long time to subside. James Oton, ABC News, Tokyo. The federal government is phasing out checks by 2030, embracing a more modern financial system. But banks are running well ahead of that timeline, with one major bank no longer processing checks from this week. Older and lower income Australians say they're being left behind as banking moves online. Pensioner Michael Coogan uses checks to pay his rent. We don't do any banking online because uh, we're not familiar enough with computers. Computers don't figure largely in our lives. Banks say checks are costly to process, even more so as fewer people use them. It's a cost that'll shift now to Mr Coogan when his bank stops issuing checks this week and he'll have to begin paying a fee to pay rent. Every cent counts. And to all those 33-year-olds and 34-year-olds out there, one day you will be 43 and 53 and 63 and you'll discover that your income shrinks. National Seniors Australia fear vulnerable people will be left behind as banking goes digital. So the banks have got to really just make sure that, you know, as a system, that they are providing support to the entire community, not just uh, the cohort that have mortgages. The use of cheques has dropped 90% in the past decade, now making up less than 1% of all transactions. The federal government admits phasing out checks will affect older and lower income Australians, but has promised an inclusive, gradual shift. Tenants Queensland is worried the end of checks will push more people onto fee charging third party platforms. In effect, the agents are subcontracting their rent, payment, their rent collection uh, requirements and also cost shifting onto the tenant. It just makes sense that you shouldn't be charged for paying your rent. The Australian Banking Association says its members are supporting customers to transition to easier, more accessible ways to pay. I'm not comfortable with it. Uh, I know 
by the number of checks, other people aren't comfortable with it. But they'll soon have to get used to it. Jessica Black, ABC News. To finance now and retail sales bounced back in January and retailers helped push the local share market higher today. Here's Alan Kohler. Retail sales rose 1.1% in January, a decent recovery from the 2.1% decline in December. But as you can see from the chart, the big picture is that the amount being spent in stores and online has levelled off after the big rise coming out of the pandemic. And what's more, that rise was all about prices. This chart separates retail sales into volume and value. The volume of shopping has been flat for two years, but values have increased by almost 10%, and that's all price. Retailers had a good session on the ASX today after Harvey Norman beat expectations with its profit result. And other results were well received as well, including the hospitals group Ramsey Healthcare, Macquarie Technology and Star Entertainment. The US market was down a bit last night. Iron ore fell 2%. And the Aussie dollar was steady, just above 65 US cents. In other news, Bitcoin has hit a new record high in Australian dollars. It's still about 20% below the 2022 peak in US dollars, but the Aussie dollar has devalued 13% in the past two years, so Australian crypto punters have been bigger winners. Meanwhile, the price of carbon dioxide emission allowances in Europe has fallen by half in the past year because emissions are falling and the demand for certificates that let companies emit has also gone down. But the price of the Australian equivalent is rising for the opposite reason. Companies are buying more Australian carbon credit units to cover their higher emissions. And that's finance. Coming up on 7.30 with Sarah Ferguson, could cost of living hurt the federal government at this weekend's by-election? I mean, you're sort of worried about what the future's going to be like. I've got six children, but uh, it's so difficult. Mortgage relief right now, interest rate reduction right now, cost of living relief right now. To see the government needs to hold. Also, comedian Hannah Gadsby joins me to discuss their new show. A Cameron Green century has prevented New Zealand from dismissing Australia for a modest total on day one of the first test in Wellington. Green thrived in difficult batting conditions and reached his second test century shortly before stumps. The home team won the toss and had no hesitation in bowling on a green tinged pitch. Not too upset with that. Uh, yeah, seems like there's been some first, first inning scores that have been big, so that's the aim today. A rare visit to New Zealand from the Australian Test team led to a sold out crowd at the Basin Reserve. Isn't that a gorgeous picture? Australia's openers survived some anxious moments. Hasn't carried through to Tom Latham at second slip. The Usman Khawaja Steve Smith combination was still finding its feet. They weren't awake to it, New Zealand. They weren't awake to it. With lunch approaching, the Black Caps finally made a breakthrough. New Zealand have their first. What a catch from Blundell, and it's Matt Henry. Manus Labashane's run of low scores in tests continued as New Zealand's pace attack dominated. Yeah. Oh, yes! What a ripper from Henry. He's got one to swing, and he's got it to swing late. Travis Head came and went. There it is. Alan Border medalist Mitch Marsh decided attack was the best approach, but it brought about his undoing on 40. High on the band, it's a big wicket. Another West Australian all-rounder stood tall. Finds the gap, that's a lovely shot. With wickets tumbling, Green accelerated to his century. That is four, that is a hundred, his second in test matches. What a sensational knock this has been. Cam Green, take a bow. Just one of those days and I think someone just needed a bat through, so yeah, I was glad it was me. Australia ended a hard-fought day with Green unconquered, but only one wicket in hand. Duncan Huntsdale, ABC News. Rejuvenated Matilda's striker Michelle Heyman is proving that age is just a number, with her four-goal blitz against Uzbekistan rocketing her into Olympics contention. The 35-year-old's performance was the exclamation mark in the Australian's 10-0 drubbing of the Uzbeks in Melbourne last night, handing coach Tony Gustafson an even tougher task of selecting the squad for Paris. After a night to remember for Michelle Heyman, you could barely wipe the smile off her face. 
So it was just a really sweet moment um, to be able to, you know, score a four. <laughs> just wild. Heyman says the past week has been an emotional roller coaster. Five years after retiring from international football, the veterans' comeback couldn't have gone better. A lot of people told me that I couldn't do it, you're too old. Um, so it's really nice to be able to show people that it doesn't matter how old you are. Heyman's heroics helped the Matildas book a ticket to Paris. The real test will come against the world's best. Can you bring the pressing intensity and the, the game out on the field when you have less time and space? But I do believe in my ability and I know how hard I've been pushing myself to, you know, get here, but I'm not stopping. Opportunities ahead of the Olympics will be thin. Australia plays Mexico in April before two yet-to-be-announced send-off matches in June. When we go to governments these days and say there's a Matildas match, they get snapped up pretty quickly. So hopefully it's in a few different cities. And competition for spots will be fierce. The squad must be cut from 23 to 18. It's always been cutthroat and I think that's the nature of, you know, the Matildas set up. Gustafsson says creating chemistry is key. So when I select a, a squad for Olympics, I might leave some players out of that roster that is better individually, but it's about building the best team. Katrina Gori has hinted the Olympics could be her farewell. For most of us, it's probably, you know, it could be our last major tournament. So I think, um, you know, to go out with a bang would be pretty amazing for all of us. Gori looking to the future. Bye-bye. Hey, <laughs> Alongside her daughter, Harper. Tom Maddox, ABC News, Melbourne. Hardcore Brisbane Broncos fans are on their way to Las Vegas where they're expected to drown out rival clubs in the NRL's historic venture to the United States. A charter flight departed Brisbane today with former rugby league stars Greg Inglis, Paul Fatty Vorton and Sam Thide on board. Broncos supporters' bays in Las Vegas are sold out for the clash on Sunday when the side opens its NRL season against the Roosters. Weather now with Jackie McLaren. And Jackie, we broke a record today. We did, Jess. Good evening, everyone. Well, as we say goodbye to summer, Brisbane bypassed the record held in 1978 today, hitting 60 consecutive nights where the minimum temperature was 20 degrees or more. And the main reason for this is due to the high humidity in our air mass that we have been experiencing. Elsewhere, and heavy rainfall around the north tropical coast overnight, scattered falls between 100 to 200 millimetres recorded. The highest falls between Ingham and Innisfail and with all of those heavy falls we do of course have current minor to moderate flood warnings issued in the north. Checking today's temperatures and Thargaminda the hot spot at a sweltering 41 degrees. Meanwhile Brisbane cooler than Applethorpe today at 31. Cooler along the coastline too with temperatures around 30 degrees and only 29 for the Redlands today. Checking photos now in Queensland sunrise really put on a Show for us. Stephen's daughter captured this stunning photo on her morning walk in Huendon. Anna managed to capture the little soldier crabs on their morning walk too in Yapoon. Meanwhile, these horses didn't feel like taking a morning walk and took in the view instead. And Meredith sure had one top coffee spot to kick off the day. Thanks for the photos. Checking the satellite now and plenty of cloud extending across the north and that's bringing that deep moisture and humid air that we have been experiencing, bringing of course the heavy rainfall with it. Checking the chart and a ridge of high pressure is extending from New Zealand, keeping conditions settled along the southeast. We're also keeping an eye on this trough, which may bring a return of showers and storms to the far west and an increase in, of temperatures with it. Taking a look at the capitals tomorrow and plenty of cloud about in the east, 32 for Canberra and a fine and sunny 34 for Perth. Meanwhile, a little bit cooler in Hobart at 24 degrees. Back home and the unsettled weather continuing in the north with storms and 100 to 2 200 millimetres of isolated falls possible, particularly between Port Douglas and Cooktown. Rockhampton expecting a fine 34 though. Warm temperatures and mostly fine inland. Storms possible in Gundawindi, expecting a warm 40 degrees there. A mostly fine Friday on the cards as well for the southeast with some cloud about along the eastern districts. The Sunshine Coast heading for 30 degrees and Gympie 33. A similar story in Brisbane with the city expecting a top of 31, 34 for Gatton and also for Ipswich. 
and checking the bay now. Winds 15 knots, seas around one metre. Sunrise will be at 5.40 in the morning and sunset at 6.20 in the evening. And taking a look at the week ahead, it looks like the weekend we might get a bit of sun on Saturday and those persistent showers are likely to pop back in in the week. Thanks, Jackie. And those overnight temperatures staying above 20 degrees. That's as well. right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that is ABC News to the moment. Thank you for your company tonight. You can stay up to date on our website. And if you ever miss our bulletin, you can catch up on iView. Time for 7.30. Good night. <laughs>